it's not the main responsibility of the man to be the provider of the family. I heard you think it. Though I am all for traditional gender roles, the man being the provider, the wife being the homemaker, there is something that's more important for men to be than being the provider. And it's something that's often overlooked, especially in our feminist-shaped Western culture, even within the church. The main responsibility of a man is to be the priest of the family, the spiritual leader. Now, what does it mean? I want to share with you six points that, in my opinion, every spiritual leader should do. And even if you don't have a family yet, you can take notes, prepare for one day leading your family. You can let me know in the comments if you agree with me or not, or if you have any other points that we can learn from. Quick disclaimer first, so that some men don't misunderstand me. Being the leader in no way means that no one else can contribute, that it's your way or the highway. You're not ruling your family with an iron fist. You're being a servant leader that wants to uplift your family. You're a team, but you are the one responsible, and I believe that it's your job to be the initiator. Number one, create a spiritual environment. You would want a culture in your home where it's normal to be spiritually minded. Now, I don't mean that you're all sitting reading your Bible all day long, but a place where it's normal to start singing to God, to bring up spiritual conversations, to have spontaneous Bible studies, an atmosphere that encourages you to think about God wanting holiness. It reminds you of God's promises, his presence, that angels are all around you. In this way, God becomes a much more active and natural part of your family's life. Now, the best way to succeed with creating such a culture, I think, is a combination of both simply daring to be a Christian in your home, which we'll come back to at point five, but also to initially create certain traditions. For example, as soon as you notice that there's a conflict, maybe it's you, maybe it's two other family members, you stop and pray together immediately. And you pray until the anger is gone the hearts are humbled and filled with love for each other, then you can resolve what was the issue. Now, every morning when we wake up, Ellie and I, we come into the room and sing, In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me you may have all this world, but give me Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Every morning, his first three words are Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's a tradition we created. While we're eating lunch, we often memorize Bible verses together in the form of a game. At supper, we all share at least three things that we're thankful for from that day. In Italy and I school papers, we often put spiritual exercises like looking up different Bible verses. You know, there's a lot of things that you can create to intentionally make your home more spiritually minded. If you got any more tips on how you do at home, share them in the comments. Moving on to number two, protect from evil influences. Of course, I cannot now tell you how to combat every specific attack of the enemy, but I can guarantee you that he will attack your family. He will try to separate them from God, to lessen their spiritual interest, to have them fall in love with the world, to turn them against God. So what you need to do as a spiritual leader is to cut off every channel that opens the door to the influence of the enemy. When we became more aware of this, we made some changes in our lifestyle that probably some would call radical, to which I would say, hey, my family is worth it. And a strong connection with God, a desire for holiness and a promise for eternal life, those are things worth protecting. I don't want to compromise those things for something just because everyone else does that or because it's more convenient. I know what's at stake. I'm not going to get distracted by some temporary things. It's okay to not do everything like the world. We shouldn't. We're called to be holy, different. So we're selective in what music we listen to, what we watch, what we eat, where we live, who we allow in our circle of influence. We cannot be lazy with this. We need to be on top of what influences we allow into our minds, our bodies, and our homes. We don't really have written down rules for this because I know from my own experience that withholding something that someone wants simply because you tell them to, that can actually have the opposite effect and you don't want your family to start to dislike God or holiness because they're not allowed to do this or that. So instead we talk and we make sure that we understand and see the potential harm that can come from that thing. So we discuss the why and that's so important because then they don't just follow something because they're told to, but they follow it 
because they understand it and want to. And then you don't just want to block things, but you need to replace it by something better. Despite the common misconception, holiness does not mean boring. There's plenty of things you can replace it with, but that's maybe a video for another time. Number three, initiate family worship. From when our son was just six months old, we've been having family worship every morning and every evening. We come together as a family, first thing before breakfast, and again, last thing before we go to bed. We pray, we read something from a spiritual book, we talk about it and we sing. Of the approximate 3,650 occasions in his life, we've probably missed less than 20 because we do it everywhere. We do it when we're visiting somewhere, when we are traveling, we just pull over and do it in the car. We highly prioritize it because besides the worship and spiritual elements of it, which is of course very precious and valuable in itself, it's also providing a security to the family. Because in our culture today, typically the parents are so busy and gone all the time, so it's very unique to have that daily family connection. It shows that we care for each other, think that it's important to have that bonding time, and it creates a feeling of safety and value for the family members. And I believe it's the responsibility of the man to initiate these daily family worships, to call everyone together, making sure it happens. When going somewhere, bringing what you need for it, be prepared. Now to go from no family worship to two times a day can be a bit too big of a change, so maybe it would be wise for you to start with choosing the mornings or evenings. In either way, I'm sure it will be a blessing to your family. Number four, empower individual devotional time. If you see that your wife or your child is kind of struggling to have their personal devotional time with God, find out what they need to succeed. Maybe you can help them by reminding them, waking them up in time, taking care of the kids so your wife has some time, helping them decide what to study, find a plan to follow, methods or structures for to pray. Maybe it needs a deeper heart-to-heart -heart conversation. See, personal devotional time is such a source of strength and relationship building with God. Every family member will function better, will be happier, contributing to making the family atmosphere more God-centered if each person has their personal devotional life on track. So don't be judging and complaining when they struggle. Be gentle, be caring, and prioritize providing the help that they need. Number five, lead by example. There's this very well-known concept, and Tim Ferriss put it in this way, kids don't do what you say, they do what they see. How you live your life is their example. I would say that this isn't just for kids, but for adults too, because the example of others has the potential to inspire us to do like them, but it can also make us push away from it. The power of leadership isn't in what you say, but in what you do. If you are unhappy, negative, tired, unkind, but you tell your family members what to do and stuff, why would they follow you? What would attract your family to do that? But if you're a happy, caring, stable leader that is enjoying life with God, your family will follow you. They see what your leadership leads to. Now, this doesn't mean that you can never have questions or be confused about something or find something hard to deal with but it is your attitude that will make the difference, whether your family gets inspired or turned off. But your example is not just important to whether they will follow your leadership or not. There comes an even greater responsibility with it. As the spiritual leader of the family, the head under Christ, you should be the closest to a physical embodiment of God to your family. Let that sink in. Your life influences the way your family sees God. See, if you are the one who says it's important to read the Bible and pray and you seem like this spiritual figure, but you're also the one who gets angry very quickly, they will think more of God that it's an angry God. If you hold the mistakes of your family against them for a long time, they will have a harder time trusting that God forgives. Being the spiritual leader is not nothing. We cannot neglect this immense responsibility. Your family is the most important thing that God has given you and you are to lead them. Nothing is more important. And that brings us to the last point, number six. Let someone else lead. Chances are that the previous point made you feel pretty inadequate and intimidated, and you feel like the weight of that responsibility, and now the idea of letting someone else do that sounds very appealing. It's like, great, you do it. And that's exactly what you need to do. Even though we are men, we are weak. Our own nature, according to the Bible, cannot do anything good. So the closest we can come to being a good spiritual leader to our family is to be a conduit, a channel for Jesus to lead through. 
Your state of surrender is what will determine the direction of your family. Trying to be this awesome leader in your own power by your own wisdom will burn you out and it won't be good for your family. But to be the man that seeks God earnestly, giving him your all, that's the man that your family needs you to be. And I know that in the church we try to be kind and we try to be considerate and we know that everyone struggles with their devotional times. They have busy lives so we kind of lower the standard to be more all-inclusive and we say, just take five to ten minutes with God. You know, do what you can. I know this is meant to be helpful but it isn't. And I honestly am tired of having low standards. Low standards are the reason why Christianity has lost its power. Why more men are leaving the churches rather than becoming those spiritual leaders. We need high standards because this is serious. If you truly believe Jesus, then do what he says and seek him first. Give him your best. Not five to ten minutes, an hour at least. An hour? I don't have that time. Yeah, you do. But you need to choose. Who do you allow to fill your schedule first? Do you let the world tell you what to do, how to spend your time, how to live and prioritize and then give God the leftovers? Or do you put God first? Your family's spiritual well-being and then you schedule the rest around it. Yes, you as the man, you are called to work hard, to provide for your family, but never ever at the expense of the spiritual well-being of your family. You're a spiritual leader first. Now I notice in my own life how my devotional life goes, so goes my family. If you want me to make a video about that, how to have a good devotional life, let me know in the comments and I will then put the link to that video in the description below once I made it. Make sure to subscribe, turn on notifications, reply to each other's comments, encourage other men, and let's continue to grow to become real men of God.